Good morning. So I'm like laughing inside, just watching the countdown. <laughs> like a lot of awkward silence. The last 15 seconds seemed like forever. But good morning. So glad everyone's here. And um, we have another great day to celebrate with our Lord and Savior. So would you please stand? And we will begin our worship set. Lord of all creation, of water, earth, and sky, the heavens are your tabernacle, glory to the Lord on high, the God of wonders beyond us. Please grab someone's hand and tell them good morning.
All right, so for announcements, we do have our quarterly meeting uh, right after church today. So you can smell there's lots of goodies back there. So thank you for those that are bringing, but please um, come to the meeting. We got a lot of important stuff to kind of cover and discuss, but um, we'll go through that later. Also, our youth group again will be this Wednesday and his kids also this Wednesday, 630 to 8. Um, for this week, and then maybe I think next week we might be off. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. It has to look at the school calendar. Okay, yeah. So, um, any other announcements? Hey, Joni. years and uh, I got my father gave me one really wise piece of advice before I got married and it's held true for 32 years on my wedding day my father said to me before you argue with your new wife and you're gonna argue with her before you do take some time step back ask yourself two questions do you want to be right or do you want to be happy <laughs> right and then he broke down and sobbed right in front of me <laughs> I had no idea what that man was talking about. <laughs> 32 years later, I can tell you this, I'm a happy, happy, happy man. <laughs> I ain't been writing 12 years now. <laughs> Sometimes I even have to ask her, am I happy? Oh, you better believe you're happy. <laughs> I was just checking with you, buttercup. <laughs> Call my friends up, I can't go golfing, but I'm a happy, happy, happy man. <laughs> And don't get me wrong, we argue. You've got to argue in your marriage. You don't argue in your marriage, it'll build up in your brain over time and fries your brain. Yeah, and then you wind up like those babbling, mumbling couples you've seen in Arizona, Florida, in 50 plus years of marriage, they're kind of walking down the street. The wife is fine. It's the poor husband eight feet behind her that scares me to death. This poor man's all hunched over, he's vibrating, mumbling, always telling me what to do. Start telling you what to do. I'm a man. You can't tell. I'm a man. I'm a man. This poor guy's starting to try to win back all the arguments he's been throwing away for 50 years. You know, he was 6'3 when he got married. Now he's four foot one. Look at the poor man. Weighed down by half a century of apathy. Leave a toilet seat up if I want to leave a toilet seat up. Tell me what to do. I hope you sit in the water every night. I don't care. Anymore. And that's when she turns around. What'd you just say to me? I didn't say nothing to you. <laughs> Scary. <laughs> other announcements before we turn it over to Pastor Brian.
again, we just wanted to uh, just remind you that uh, part of our worship is giving as well. And uh, so we just want to remind you and, again, let you know that uh, the in the foyer, of course, is the box for giving. Oftentimes we just walk by that and, and then we get home and the spouse says or wife says to the husband, did you uh, write a check or whatever? And we go, ah, oh, no. So we just want to remind you of that so that you can be blessed as you give to the Lord. And also we're trying to, you know, incorporate in our worship. We want it to be a worshipful experience too. So what I'll do here, I'll read our call to worship, and then I'll pray and as well as incorporate giving in that prayer, okay? The psalmist says, My heart is steadfast, O God. I will sing and make music with all my soul. Awake, harp and lyre. I will awaken the dawn. I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations. I will sing of you among the peoples. For great is your love, higher than the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens, and let your glory be over all the earth. Let's pray together. Lord, we have gathered here this morning to honor you and... uh, exalt your name. Lord, at times things kind of get in the way of doing that. It's amazing how that trip from home to church sometimes derails our spirit as we seek to meet with you. And uh, so therefore, Lord, we just want to confess to you whatever is derailing, I guess, our spirit and our emotions. Uh, Because, Lord, at this time, we really want to hear your voice and uh, and meet with you. And so, Lord, may you be honored. Lord, we again acknowledge that all we have comes from you. And, Lord, too, we desire to be generous and givers. Uh, Lord, we pray that through our giving, not only are you uh, honored and glorified because we sacrificed what we have, but Lord, we also know that in our giving, Lord, you bless. You've asked us to test you in that, to be dependent upon faith and give even though we may be reluctant. And so therefore, Lord, we look forward to how you will also bless us, and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Okay, would you please stand? We'll continue with the worship set. Like a ring of solid gold, like a vow that is tested, like a covenant of old. Your love is enduring through the winter rain and beyond the horizon. With mercy for today, faithful you have been, and faithful you will be. Pledge yourself to me, and that's why I sing your praise will never be on my lips, never be on my lips, your praise will never be on my lips, never be on my lips, your praise will never be on my lips, never be on my lips.
Suffering anguish, despised and rejected, bearing our sins, my Redeemer is He. The hands that He issued stretched out on a tree and took the nails for me. Oh, 
just to bring something that's a word that will bless your heart. I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within things appear. You're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about single breath I'll bring you more than a song for a 
song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within, in the way things appear. You're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you. All about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I made you. But it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. Gracious Father, we do know that it is all about you. We live in such a crazy world. It's easy to get distracted just by the politics and the inflation and just everything that gets in our way. And God, I just pray that we would just maintain our focus on you and that your will be done. God, I pray that you could still use us and work through us and um, us not be distracted by everything that's going on just through the details and the crazy busy life but God that we could just continue to keep our focus on you and continue that work God I pray you would just use us to do that and we pray all this in Jesus name amen you may be seated Oh, Elijah, come on up, bud. <laughs> okay. Oops. Hey, guys. Very good. Glad you're here. Okay, am I here or am I not here? Okay, close your eyes. Close your eyes. Am I here or not here? Can you see me? So how do you know I'm here? Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, do they? Okay. Yeah, when you open your eyes, they open your eyes. Lucy, grab a hold. It's safe. Am I here or not here? I'm here. Okay, close your eyes again. Am I here or not here? Yes, how, how, Okay, Lucy, how do you know that I'm here? Because I can feel you. You can feel me. Okay. Okay. So, so you know that I'm here because you can see me at times. Okay, you can open your eyes now. <laughs> You're not blind anymore. So you know I'm here because you can see me, right? You know that I'm here because you can hear me. You know that I'm here because you can, can touch me, right? Yeah, you know that I'm here because you can smell me. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. That's your brother. That's your brother. I don't know. Okay. Okay, now here's another question. This one's a little bit tougher question. Is, uh, is God here or not here? Uh -huh. God is everywhere. Okay, you can't see him. Can you, uh, can you touch God? Kind of. Okay. You there? Okay. 
Well, okay, so we know that he's here, and uh, we would say that he's here in spirit, okay? That's what we would say. And, and his spirit is alive, and it's powerful, so it, his spirit's working, and it changes our hearts, the spirit. Now, here's what I want you to here, catch this part. Did you know that one day Jesus is coming back, and he's going to be here physically, just like you're here physically? Yeah, that's okay. All righty. That's right. He wants everybody to know him before he comes back. That's right. So I'll, what I really wanted you to know is uh, even though we can't see him and feel him, you know, and talk to him right now, there is a day coming when we can see him, when we can touch him, when we can talk to him. It's called his second coming. What are you going to say? You can hear him and you can smell him. So, so when Jesus, when you first, is this going to be your first response when you see Jesus? Are you going to run up there and say, hey, can I smell you? No. No, you don't know how to. I'm going to oh, ask gonna... all the questions that nobody can answer. Are you? Yeah? Okay. Well, I like that one there. Coffee, that was a good answer. We're going to give him a hug. That's going to be awesome. All righty, guys. Well, now it's children's church, okay? It's children's church, but remember, God is coming back. Jesus is coming back, and we will see him. We'll be able to touch him. We'll be able to talk to him. That's going to be a great, great day. Thanks for coming up here. Thanks for coming. All right. You guys are dismissed for Children's Church. All righty. Well, if you have a copy... Loud, huh? <laughs> we do have, uh, if you do have a copy of God's Word with you, your Bible, I want to invite you to join me. We're in Matthew chapter 13 again as we continue in our series of working through the Gospel of Matthew. And there's lots and lots of good stuff in Matthew, as you have already gleaned from that. But we're in chapter 13, and we'll be looking once again at another parable, another story that Jesus told. All right? And uh, before we get into that parable, it's called the parable of the weeds. But before we get into that uh, particular story, that parable that Jesus told, let me just uh, begin by a review. And what I want to review with you is I just want to touch upon what is a parable. Because uh, as you, if you can remember and recall from last week, I spoke how Jesus had been in teaching and sharing with the people that followed him, the crowds and so forth. Well, then Jesus all, all of a sudden kind of changed his teaching style. And so he went to telling stories, which were the parables. And uh, parables, there's some things about the parables I want you to remember. So we're going to do a kind of a review. So here's the first thing I wanted you to remember regarding a parable. A parable is intended to convey a spiritual truth. And some have explained a parable with these words. They'll, they call a parable a earthly story with a heavenly meaning, okay? So I'll just invite you to file that away in your mind. A parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. So when Jesus told the story, he had a spiritual point that he wanted to convey. So that's number one, a heavenly story with a, or excuse me, an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. So here's number two. Parables are designed to call the listener such as yourself, call the listener into participation, okay? And so as you hear a story, you are challenged to participate by either identifying, identifying with one of the characters or perhaps uh, something else that's in that story. We are to identify with it. So as Jesus tells his parables, he invites his audience to kind of step into it and participate, asking themselves, okay, what, how, what do I identify with? What what speaks to me? Am I like this or am I like that? So we want to participate in the parable. And so to keep those things in mind this morning as we continue talking about parables. Again, a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. 
And a parable invites each one of us to step into that story and participate. So, what do you identify with as you listen to that story? So, this morning's parable is entitled, The Wheat and the Tares, or the Parable of the Weeds. And I'm going to invite you to follow along, and then we're going to read that story at this time. Okay, so we're in Matthew chapter 13. I begin reading in verse 24. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servant came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, Do you want us to go and pull them up? No, Jesus answered, because while you are pulling the weeds, you may root up the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, you will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned, then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. So a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And if you're like me, and if, even if you're not like me, I know for myself, I always struggle, okay, what is the spiritual point here? And I'll confess, I don't get it. Oftentimes, I just don't get it. But fortunately, Jesus follows up with an explanation. So let's go to that explanation beginning in verse 34. Then he left the crowd and went into the house. His disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. Well, I do find comfort, but even the disciples, they didn't get it. Well, Jesus answered. Here's the explanation. The one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the the good seed stands for the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out His angels, and they will weed out of His kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the fiery furnace, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. He who has ears, let him hear. Here ends the reading of our story this morning. Well, as I begin, I want to share with you that there is a theological concept uh, that we need to understand that will aid us in understanding the parables that Jesus is telling us. And that theological concept is called the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven. That particular phrase pops up numerous times, like in verse 24, first of all. Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is like, and then he tells his parable, okay? And there's five other times throughout just chapter 13 where Jesus uses that phrase, the kingdom of heaven is like, okay, five other times. And let me just add, too, when you speak of the kingdom of heaven, if you go to the other gospels, such as Mark and Luke and so forth, they refer to it as the kingdom of God, okay? So the phrase kingdom of heaven is kind of unique, in meaning Matthew is the one who just uses that phrase, the kingdom of heaven. The other writers, they refer to it as the kingdom of God. So the reason I share that with you is that if you hear kingdom of God this morning from my mouth or kingdom of heaven, we're talking about the same thing, okay? But we need to understand what is this kingdom of heaven? What is the kingdom of God? Because it's always mentioned in his parables. The kingdom of heaven is like this, and then he tells his story. Well, what is the kingdom of heaven then, or the kingdom of God? The simplest meaning I can share with you, and this is, again, in simplistic form, the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is simply 
the rule of God. Okay, that's where we're going to call it. So when we speak of the, if you read and you read about the the kingdom of heaven, or the writer talks about the kingdom of God, they are referring to the rule of God. Okay, the rule of God, talking about His rule. So that is the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, is talking about the rule of God or the rule of Jesus. You know, His authority. Uh, he is. Uh, in charge. Now, I'm going to complicate things a little bit more here, all right? Uh, and I'm going to inform you that the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven has two expressions, all right? There is the spiritual expression of the kingdom of heaven, and there is the physical expression of the kingdom of heaven, okay? So there's two aspects to the kingdom. So Jesus says the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is like. Of course, we're referring to the rule of God. Now, that rule of God is expressed spiritually as well as it's going to be expressed physically. And I'll, I'll uh, explain a little bit more about that, and I, I think you'll get it, okay? So we talk about the physical rule. Remember, there's a spiritual rule and there's a physical. The physical rule of Jesus was offered to the Jewish people. And that's what we find out as we read through the Gospels. When Jesus came into this world, he did legitimately offer the kingdom to the Israelite people because he was indeed the Messiah. And he confirmed to the people that he was the legitimate ruler by miracles, the, the healing of the blind, uh, the healing of those who were crippled, he also, Jesus also cast out demons, demonstrating his authority. And uh, if people would have recognized that he, yes, indeed is the Messiah who came into the world and embraced that, then the kingdom of God physically would be there because Jesus is there and he would be ruling. But as we read on in the Gospels, we find out that Israel rejected Jesus, Okay. For example, in chapter 9, when Jesus cast out the demons, what did the religious leaders say? Well, here's what they said in verse 34. They said, hey, it's by the prince of demons that Jesus drives out demons. And uh, so they attributed his power to Satan. Okay, that's what the religious leaders did. And then as we read on, we also see in chapter 12 that the Pharisees went out and plotted how they might kill Jesus. So that is the attitude. That's the environment that Jesus is in. So Jesus legitimately, he came presenting the kingdom where he would be ruling physically and in present presence, okay? It was a, a bona fide offer. But what we discover is that the people rejected his legitimate offer of him ruling as their king. They rejected that. And of course, they ended up killing him by placing him on the cross. Now, people of that time might have thought, hey, yes, we know how to deal with our enemies, so to speak, or those that we do not agree with. But understand, this is all part of God's plan. Okay, it's all part of God's plan. But what I want you to understand is that Jesus, first of all, did offer a legitimate kingdom where he would physically, in person, rule. But he was rejected. And when he was rejected, things changed a bit. And that's where we come to the spiritual rule. Remember, I said there's two aspects of the kingdom. There is the physical rule of Jesus, but there's also what we call the spiritual rule of Jesus when it speaks of the kingdom of heaven. So consequently, Jesus' physical rule on the earth was postponed. And we are told in Revelation chapter 20 uh, that Jesus will return in the near future He's going to return, and he's going to set up what we call the millennial kingdom, okay? And the millennial kingdom refers to that thousand-year reign where Jesus himself is physically present, okay? He is in person there. You can see him. You can touch him. You can speak with him. But anyhow, he's going to physically, personally rule during that thousand years, okay? The kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God will be there. We'll see it during that millennium, because Jesus is there. 
So he, one day, Jesus will come to earth and he will set up this kingdom where he will rule as king. And Jesus will be there in bodily form. He'll be physically present. Although Jesus is physically absent at this time, yet Jesus is ruling spiritually. Remember, there's two aspects to the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. His kingdom is here spiritually. And then in the future, his kingdom will be here physically, where we will see, hear, be able to touch Jesus, ruling, all right? But right now, it's just the spiritual dimension, okay? God's spiritual kingdom is now in operation. People's sins are being forgiven. People are hearing the gospel story, and their lives are being changed. They're becoming new creations, okay? Okay? And the church, our church, all churches, we're here. We're in operation. And so what these show us, the changed lives, the gospel, the church, it tells us that the kingdom of heaven is here, spiritually speaking, okay? The kingdom of heaven is now here. So when Jesus is talking about and telling his stories, and he says and he begins by saying the kingdom of heaven is like, or the kingdom of God is like, he's talking about Right now, spiritually. The kingdom is in operation right now, spiritually speaking. We can't see Jesus. We can't talk to Jesus or touch Jesus. But the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, is alive and active and powerful. And it's doing, and, it, and the work of God is being done. So this, the spirit of the kingdom is here. Um, uh, Riley, Shay, and Matt Wall and I, we've been meeting on a monthly basis, we're engaged in a theological study. Uh, they are committed to three years of study. Well, anyhow, it just happens to be that our study at this point has been the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. So we've been spending time together talking about the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. And we are reading a book that talks about the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. And it's written by a theologian whose name is... George Ladd. Well, anyhow, Mr. Ladd, or Professor Ladd, has coined a phrase that I think that I want to share with you. This phrase will help us understand this whole concept, this whole uh, topic, theological topic of the kingdom of God. And here's his phrase that he uses to talk about the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. He says it was this way, the kingdom of heaven is already not yet. Okay, that's his phrase. The kingdom of heaven is already not yet. Let's dive into that a little bit. When he says the kingdom of God is already, he's talking about the spiritual operation uh, of his kingdom, okay, the spiritual part. Again, people are being saved when they hear the gospel. People are being forgiven of their sins. Um, lives are being changed through the gospel, and the church is in operation. These things indicate to us that the kingdom of heaven is already here. Okay, are you following me a little bit here? I know it's kind of deep, but it's already. That's the part of it that we're, we're experiencing in the kingdom of heaven. It's already here, spiritually speaking. Okay, But there's also the not yet. Remember he says already, not yet? Well, the kingdom of heaven is not yet, too. What's that mean? Well, Jesus is not here physically and personally ruling on this earth. He's not here yet. However, there will one day, one day there will be a change. Jesus will come again, okay? And we talked about this. He's going to come, and he's going to set up his millennial rule. Again, the millennial kingdom is that 1,000-year rule that takes place prior to eternity, well, anyhow, it's during this 1,000 years that Jesus himself is physically present and he is ruling. And we will be able to go up to him and uh, talk to him, give him a hug if we choose so, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, we'll see him. He's there physically. And so that's the whole idea of the kingdom. The kingdom is already here. We're participating in it because the Holy Spirit's at work. People's lives are being changed forgiveness of sin, 
believe in faith in Jesus Christ, we experience eternal life. That's already, that's going on. But not yet in the sense, well, his bodily form is not here yet. He's not here personally. He's in operation using the Holy Spirit already right now, but not yet is he here physically and personally. He's coming. He's coming. All right? And it may be sooner than we are expecting. Okay? All righty. So when, the, when, it, when it comes to the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God, think of it in terms of already and not yet. Already we are experiencing it because of the Holy Spirit changing lives, the gospel is being presented, the church is in existence, but not yet in the sense, well, we, not yet do we see Jesus, but we will. He is coming again, the second coming. He is coming, okay? It's not yet, but it's coming. All righty. Even though Jesus is not physically present, His rule is taking place. Spiritually, God is at work in our world. And the parables that we are looking at give us an idea of, of what the kingdom looks like. Okay, so we're, the, the point this morning is, yes, uh, the kingdom is here, spiritually speaking, and it was offered during Jesus' time. Okay, so you're saying it's here right now. What does the kingdom of God look like right now? Well, that's the, that's the point of the parables. They give us a picture of what the kingdom of God already, okay, now is like. So let's talk about these parables. Uh, the parable that we're going to look at again, of course, is the, the parable of the wheat and the weeds. And the parable tells us about the kingdom already, what's going on now, what, how, what it looks like. Uh, first of all, I'm going to share four things with you about the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. And the first thing I want to share with you is that the word of God or the gospel is an action, okay? Is an action. The gospel is in action. Now, last week, we talked about the parable of the sower and where the, where the sower, the farmer, went out and scattered his seed. And really, that parable is about soils because when the seed, the seed fell on four types of soil. And let me just review those with you really quick, okay? Um, Uh, it, first of all, there was the soil type that fell on the path, which was hard, and uh, the birds of the air came and swooped down and they ate up the seed. And Jesus says that refers to the evil one. Uh, somebody's heart, okay, the soils, their heart is hard and they don't buy into what Jesus is teaching and Satan comes along and he takes away whatever possibilities there were. They rebel, they reject Jesus. That's the first soil, okay? The second soil talks about how the seed fell among rocks uh, and shallow soil. And it tells us that the plants sprung up really quickly because of the heat and the available moisture right there, so they grew up real quick. But it tells us that uh, they died because they had a new root system. And Jesus goes on to explain there's people that uh, they get excited about Jesus but because they don't really have a foundation, any roots, when difficulty and persecution comes, they say, I don't want any part of it. And so they reject Jesus that way. Okay? Uh, the third soil type was the, um, it fell among thorns and weeds, okay? And then it sprung up, the thorns sprung up, sprung up with the good, the wheat. So we have your thorns and we have your wheat, they spring up, and Jesus tells us that the wheat choke out the good, okay? And, the, and therefore, that plant dies too. And the reason that dies is Jesus says, uh, tribulation in this life as well as the deceitfulness of wealth. So maybe just the whole idea of being in, into commercialism or whatever, wanting toys, wanting these things, those things become more important. Uh, and then Jesus, and therefore there's a falling away from God because the things of the world are more important to them. And then the fourth soil type is good soil, where the seed falls in good soil and it springs up and it produces a harvest of 160 and 30 fold. That's the good soil. Okay, back to the kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. Those soil types are active right now already. There are people that say, I don't want anything to do with Jesus. 
There are people who get excited about Jesus, but when, it get, when the going gets tough, they say, ah, that's not for me, okay? Already right now, there's a soil type where the deceitfulness of the worldly wealth and so forth, the things of the world, that's more appealing to them rather than faith in Jesus. And there is a soil type right now already in this world where they say, yes, I need Jesus. And Jesus comes in, changes their life, and they produce 160 or 30-fold harvest. That's already, that's the harvest right now, already in the kingdom of heaven. Remember, the kingdom of heaven is active, spiritually speaking, right now. And there are soil types that are being in operation, okay? So the gospel is in action right now, already. Also already in this spiritual kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, spiritually speaking, number two is this, Satan is in operation. Look at verse 39, chapter 13, verse 39. The enemy who sows them is the devil. Remember, they had wheat and they had weeds that sprung up together. And the servants said, hey, didn't we plant good seed? And the owner says, yes, we did, but the enemy... My enemy has sown seed of weeds. And that's what's going on right now. All right? So, and he says, that guy that sowed this, the rotten seed, the weeds, that's Satan. All right? And we saw that in the parable of the soils. The, the seed fell on the packed pathway, and the birds swang, they swooped down and ate up the seed. Okay? And Jesus says, the bird represents Satan, who takes out you know, the seed, the gospel, takes it. So, point is, in this kingdom right now already, the spiritual kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, Satan is in operation. He's doing his dirty work. Okay, that's number two. Number three, the kingdom of heaven has believers. Right now, in existence, there are followers of Jesus Christ who are producing a harvest of 100 or 60 or 30 fold. Okay, that's going on right now. I mean, the kingdom of heaven is already, that's going on. Look at verse 38. Jesus, as he explains the parable of the weeds and the wheat, he says, the field is the world, and the good seed stands for the sons of the kingdom. Those are the believers. Okay, so we have believers that are already now in existence in the kingdom of heaven. And then number four, lastly, the kingdom of heaven has unbelievers. Okay, unbelievers. That's in verse 38. Let's look at it again. The field is the world, and the good seed stands for the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one. Okay? So remember, the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is already and not yet. So we've been talking about the already. Okay? The gospel is active and is changing lives already. We have unbelievers in the church or out there. They've made a profession, maybe, and uh, they've fallen away. And we also have believers. I mean, that's where we're at right now. That's the kingdom. And Jesus is using the parables to tell us, this is what your kingdom looks like that you are participating in right now. Okay? And then one day, he's going to come back physically, okay, in the second coming. So it's not yet, but he will return, okay? So those are the two aspects, again, of the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. There's the already and there's the not yet. And we're experiencing the already right now. Now, there's something very significant told to us in this parable that we're looking at. There's also a coming judgment. The kingdom of heaven, heaven has both the righteous and the unrighteous, the tares and the wheat, the unrighteous and the righteous. The kingdom of heaven right now is occupied by those who have accepted the gospel and trusted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And right now, this kingdom of heaven, the spiritual kingdom that we're experiencing, there's also people who have rejected the gospel. And they want nothing to do with Jesus, okay? Well, Jesus tells us that, that uh, all this will be sorted out. We have unbelievers and we have believers. He says, it's going to be sorted out one day. And that's what verses 41 and 42 are talking about. Look at, it, look at it with me. So here's Jesus' words. He says this. 
The Son of Man will send out His angels, and they will weed out of His kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will be thrown into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So Jesus tells us with his words that there is a place for evil. There is a place for those who reject his message of good news. There is a place. And it's not a happy place. It's not a happy place. But it is a place that can be avoided. All right? So, a parable. We're talking about parables. It's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And we are invited to participate in this. And we talked about what the kingdom of heaven is all about. There is the already aspect that is present right now, spiritually speaking, where God is at work, the Holy Spirit's at work, lives are being changed, forgiveness is offered, and eternal life is being accepted. That's the kingdom of heaven already. And there is an aspect of the kingdom of heaven that is not yet, which refers to one day Jesus Christ himself will come back and he will establish his throne and he will rule physically and in person. Is that happening right now? Not yet, but it is coming. So how do we apply this particular message this morning? Well, let me, here's some application thoughts for you, okay? Uh, the first of all, how can this apply to me? I'm going to say this can in, uh, give you more knowledge, okay? Maybe not so much this is what you need to do, but this is something regarding knowledge, and the knowledge is this, the kingdom of heaven, when he speaks about it, the kingdom of heaven, it's already and not yet, okay? Hopefully you kind of got some understanding of that. It's already, but there's also the physical part that's not come yet, it's not yet, okay? So I want you to, to be aware of that. Second of all, regarding knowledge, what I want you to know is that in the end, even though already right now in the kingdom of heaven, there's unbelievers and there's believers, Jesus is going to sort it out. Okay, it's going to be all figured out. And the, the wheat, excuse me, yeah, the wheat will be gathered together, but, but the weeds, they're going to be bundled, and they're going to be thrown into the fiery furnace. So what we need to walk away with, yes, there is a hell. That's important. It was interesting. I was reading some things, and it seems that there is a trend out there. Yes, if you do a survey, people will say, yes, I believe in heaven. And they think they're going to go there one day. But then when you ask them about hell, they don't think there is a hell. They believe there's a heaven, but they don't necessarily buy into the idea, the theological truth, that there is a hell. The Bible is telling us there is a hell, and we don't want to go there. Okay? So, a couple of items for word of knowledge, I guess you could say, or just, just growing in our knowledge of God's word. The kingdom is already and not yet, and there is hell. Okay, there's not, one more application is regarding our destination, and this can fall into the category of doing. The first one was just information, knowledge. This one's about doing. So if you place yourself in the story, we need to ask yourself, am I wheat or am I a weed? Am I a son or daughter of the king, or am I a son or daughter of the evil one? Okay. This is where you can do something about it. Yesterday was a, we went to a wedding at Calvary Gospel, and thoroughly enjoyed being there. Uh, Pastor Randy presented the gospel on the, by the request of the couple. And uh, here, one part that really stuck with me regarding the gospel was, he says, when it comes to, to let's do it this way, when it comes to either spending your eternity with Jesus Christ, the King, or spending your eternity with the evil one, you have a vote. Okay? 
In fact, you are the breaking vote. You're the tie-breaking vote. Satan has cast his vote. He says, I want you to remain in hell forever and ever. Jesus says, no, I've come and I've given my life. I've given my best. I've given my all. I want you to be in heaven with me. So we have a tie. And you are the tiebreaker. So when it comes to your destination, you have a vote. Know that one day, God will sort it out. Those who've rejected will be cast into the fiery furnace, the abyss, outer darkness, uh, the lake of fire. These are all the words that Jesus uses to describe what's in store for those who reject his gospel message and reject him. Or you can cast your vote for Jesus and enjoy eternity. You get to reign and live personally with the king and serve him. It's a good place. So, parables ask you and invite you to put yourself in the parable. Where are you at? Are you a weed or are you a wheat? That's what we need to ask ourselves. If you're a weed, I invite you to do something about it. Cast your vote for Jesus Christ. How do you do that? Simple. Jesus, I want to be on your team. Jesus, I cast my vote for you. Save me. Bring me into your family. That's how you do it. All right? Let's pray. God, thanks again for the opportunity just to talk about your word. Uh, kind of a, a an interesting, perhaps even a difficult concept, understanding your heaven, uh, your kingdom, I mean. Lord, you've told us that it's here and it's, and it's also coming. It's kind of like, what's that mean? Well, Lord, we do understand, and we understand that right now your Holy Spirit's active. You're using the church to change lives so that they can spend eternity with you. That is what's going on already, and we thank you for that. But Lord, we also look forward to that which is not yet, when you personally will be on this world, in this earth. We look forward to talking to you, hugging you, just being close to you. And we pray this in Jesus' name.